Well, welcome back, dear friends. Uh, just want to be mindful of this, that we're starting part two of, I guess, time period seven for this A-PUSH course. Um, second thing I need to be mindful of is as I go through and answer these key questions and give you kind of a brief synopsis of it, I'm also giving you pieces of outside evidence that you can cite along with some key aspects as to why they're significant. And so as you continue to drill down on this A-PUSH information, be mindful that uh, these would be great both for the SAQ, for the LEQ, the DBQ, and to make your uh, case for the multiple choice questions perhaps go quicker as you read through the stems. Okay, with that, without further ado, let's go to the next question. And it asks, what issues concerned the progressives? So I need to spend just a little moment on, on the progressives. Be mindful that there was the populist movement that happened before this time. And I'll talk about that in the Panic of 1893. But the populists um, were basically essentially with the Omaha platform were frustrated about this idea that, <clears throat> excuse me, there wasn't enough money available and since money was tied to how much gold we had in order to print the species of it or fiat um, we we had to find other means and so along comes william jennings bryan who argues for this idea of taking silver and coming up with a ratio of 16 to 1 in order to print out money to help meet the fluidity of coin necessary well out of this out of this movement uh, we create this thing called the Progressive Era. So let me give you a little bit about what the Progressive Era was. So it's rising out of big business and all of the industrialization that took place during the second great um, industrial revolution. We have a lot of uncertainties taking place in the economy, increasing violent uh, conflicts between the labor and business interests, um, the influence of political machines like Boss Tweed and Tammany Hall, with the Jim Crow segregation taking place in the South as a result of the Reconstruction Act of 1877, where the North basically abandoned the South. And then we have the rights of women that are, are going to be elevated during this time period. So I guess what issue helps trigger some of this is called the Panic of 1893. And the Panic of 1893 basically was in about the year of 1891, farmers had continued to expand of their, their farms and buying more equipment like the McCormick Reaper, buying the John Deere plow, et cetera, and, and expanding their acreage. And in so doing, they took on more debt. Well, there was a financial downturn um, caused by many of these wheat farmers experienced a lot of, um, I guess, hardship caused by the environment. And with that, there was a major downturn of, of ability to grow as much wheat as they needed. This causes a major glut and a challenge for the economy. And then to compound this, there was this few railroads during this time that were considered so big, so large that they couldn't fail. Well, two of the railroads did fail, causing tremendous economic hardship across the American landscape. And so there were a lot of uh, changes that came as a result of this, but one of them is it created an economic depression that was greatly impacted, not only by the farmers and the populace, but also it's going to create a lot of challenge for those living uh, in the cities and the urban areas. So we call it the, the, the Panic of 1893 and how this helps trigger the populist movement. Well, who were the muckrakers? And um, so let me give you a little definition of them. And this is these were investigative journalists uh, that attempted to expose corporate corruption, mistreatment of workers, and to shed light on the problems of the poor, the urban, the children, labors going on, and predominantly the immigrant communities uh, that were there. One such said person is called Jacob Reese, R-I-I-S, who wrote the How the Other Half Lives. We talked much about him in class. We have Upton Sinclair, who wrote an expose about uh, the meatpacking industry, and as a result, some legislation was passed for that. But for right now, I'm going to talk about a female. Her name is Ida Tarbell, who exposed Standard Oil and its horizontal business practices that were on the cusp. Uh, I wouldn't call them illegal at the time because trusts and monopolies weren't considered illegal. Um, ergo, rise to uh, Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft. But we're a little, that's a little ahead of the game. But she, she challenged that um, 
Rockefeller and Standard Oil um, were doing undue business practices. So you can see a picture of, you know, the, the leader there, Rockefeller, gobbling down all sorts of other businesses, basically his competition. And so Ida Tarbell wrote a huge, very impactful expose about these business practices, revealing to modern, not modern, but average Americans what uh, this business practice was about, and thus helping elevate the role of the muckrakers like Reese, Sinclair, and, and Tarbell to raising awareness to where there needs to be some definite changes in how government is done. Well, what kind of reforms uh, did these progressives and, and muckrakers seek? Well, one of them was in this idea of changing how our Senate was comp uh, comprised. Basically, you would have different um, regional congressional districts, uh, even maybe the governors of those said states that they would choose who their senators were. And senators are really important uh, then as they are now because they're the ones that sign treaties. They're the ones that um, determine uh, what tariffs should be passed. They determine cause and course of various business practices, uh, et cetera, laws, constitutional matters. So if these few people were put into place by wealthy industrialists, um, then they're obviously going to vote and have sway over passing legislation that will gain the the one or two percent of the industrialists that controlled most of the money in that time. So the definition of what these progressives saw is that it, in, especially in this situation, the Seventeenth Amendment. Uh, this was a secret ballot to limit the influence of political machines, and so. Um, from that, um, that they wanted to have direct election of senators, um, which we still we have to this day, courtesy of the 17th Amendment, to in, have initiative referendums and even recalls that uh, local, um, I guess, precincts can uh, bring to a vote and hopefully usher changes at the local level and uh, where the vote counts and matters to change things at a macro level at like the federal government state. So the 17th Amendment was a huge victory uh, for people to begin um, having a greater say in how politics is usual in our government. Um, how did Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. E. Du Bois uh, uh, approach the civil rights and how did they differ? So let's be mindful of this. This has been a uh, usually an LEQ in the past because it's a really great thing to compare and contrast and even talk about changes over time when we talk about civil rights movement in the 1950s and then again in the 1960s. So these, these two gentlemen uh, are, are quite important. So with that, let me give you a brief definition. I'm going to give you some uh, pieces of evidence to, to cite. So basically, Washington argued that Blacks should focus on improving education and economic opportunity within the black community before they demanded equality. So they think you should start at the bottom and win the uh, favor of the white majority. And then in so doing, they will have a greater access to um, things made available to the majority. Whereas Du Bois argued the inverse, claiming that political equality would only allow blacks to enjoy improved education, economic opportunity. So basically, change things at the macro level, at the top, starting with SCOTUS, and then working their way down to legislative measures that will then be implemented federally and that then will impact things through the statewide legislation. And so um, one such um, thing is called the Atlantic Compromise. And so here's a famous speech given by Booker T. Washington, where he was talking to predominantly a white audience. So he's endearing himself to the white audience. And now Please forgive me. I'm not trying to appropriate this. I'm just trying to historically speak into it. Booker T. Washington um, basically said that we as a persons of uh, persons of color in our community, we have to do what we can to uh, join in and find ways in which we don't antagonize, but find a way to um, serve beside and alongside the white majority. Um, he called this in his speech, they, they referred to it as um, this this, you know, bucket, if you will, and this bucket was was meant to be illustration of the white man above the persons of color, and they come in a boat, and this boat has all the things required for a life of success and 
lacking of no want, etc. And so here then you have this lower little canoe where the persons of color, this is the allegory, are. And so they're looking up at the boat saying, you know, send down a bucket, put down the bucket. So the idea is that then the white community uh, would then send down a bucket uh, to the persons of color to help them receive the nourishment and the water they need in order to sustain themselves. So this is a symbiotic idea where Booker has a vision that not be antagonistic, but let's find a ways to work and journey together on that. So that, that is called the Atlanta Compromise. And here you can see a picture of uh, this uh, in the political cartoon is you have um, a well-versed and learned person of color who has gone off to college is coming. That would be referencing to the Tuskegee uh, school that uh, Booker T. Uh, Washington started, that he is using this to train up and equip other people who are maybe not as knowledgeable as he. And that through this, you're going to find positivity um, received by, of course, the Uncle Sam, the white guy sitting on the other side of things, as that this is um, going to be better uh, for society uh, at large. Well, on the opposite of that is you have another man named, as I alluded to, uh, good old W.B. Du Bois. He argued uh, at this Niagara movement that if we ever want to have change, we have to demonstrate uh, this change by the top 10 percent, the talented 10 percent, to go and, and go to the colleges, go become professionals, go become doctors or lawyers, uh, you know, higher uh, elevated positions. And that way then they can have an influence towards emancipation for all persons of color. So they're working their way from the top all the way down. Let's go on to then the next. So who were the progressive presidents and what efforts and legislation were accomplished during each of their administrations? Well, the first progressive president that we typically and must know is good old Teddy Roosevelt. Um, Teddy had quite a few things of which, you know, he, he argued for. One, he talked about the square deal. Um, here you see a picture of the square deal. Uh, one side of him, he's turning his back on all the fat um, industrialists that have been uh, gobbling up most of the wealth and the experiences and um, where they live and controlled tons of politics to where he's now offering to the people who are bowing before him, follow me and I will give you a square deal. What is a square deal? That's those three things listed here that he was going to attack corporations, basically become a trust buster and eliminate monopolies. He's then going to provide consumer protections in terms of what he called the Pure Food and Drug Act the Meat Inspection Act, the Few Food and Drug Administration called the FDA. We still have some of these in various forms still in modern day America. So to say that his influence has not been felt, it certainly has. Um, and another thing is the Conservation Act. This is an interesting thing where he passed the Forest Reserve Act um, in, in a way that was rather unique. There was this tension point. You have John Muir who talked about preservation he believed that the national parks that would be created, the first one being Yellowstone and off to, uh, to Yosemite, that these spaces of beauty and tranquility should be preserved in their most natural sense. And so what does that mean? The government buys them out, secures them, and gives minimal, minimal access to people um, to enjoy. Well, um, Teddy Roosevelt didn't like that. He had his Secretary of Interior at the time, um, Ping Cho, um, argue differently, that they argued that it shouldn't be about preservation, but conservation. And so this is where the government then began spending monies to um, create spaces where people can go, have trails, they built large lodges, they even allowed businesses to come, like um, forestry and, and logging businesses to come and, and pay for their rights to cut down the said trees and then replant them. So that way in 30 or 40 more years, then they can go back and reharvest those types of things. So it's basically conservation versus preservation. Again, John Muir is the one uh, uh, with the Sierra Club out of San Francisco that argued for the preservation and the government argued for conservation to which we still have that same tension point going on in modern day time. What would be the tension point? Well, um, we should perhaps, as preservationists, we should dismantle all of the dams, for instance, the Hoover Dam and all the rest of them on Lake Mead, Lake Mojave, et cetera, to that way 
bring it back to its natural state. And then you have the conservationists like, well, look, those dams have held purpose, brings electricity as water storage. And I'm not going to get into all their other opinions for that. So I don't want to get in trouble. But there is still that tension point between these two uh, groups. Going on to the second president, we have William H. Taft, who was the vice president of Teddy Roosevelt, and who most people, if you look in this political cartoon, was going to follow in the same footsteps as good old Teddy Roosevelt. But what made this interesting and why people voted for him is that um, they thought he would continue the legacy of Teddy Roosevelt, but he did an about face in some ways and did things on his own terms, on his own means, on his own measures. The one thing that we can say, and that was unique about William H. Taft, Howard Taft, is that he ironically busted trust two times the amount that Teddy Roosevelt did. So Teddy claims to be the bus trusting president. That is a misnomer. It is good old Taft that did. And um, that's just something we should be minded. So he was the legit trust buster. Yet he also continued the conservationist policies that his predecessor Teddy did uh, in this time. And the last president that we want to kind of mention that was a progressive president, that is good old Woodrow Wilson. We'll talk more about him as we embark into World War I. But for the lack of a better thing, he is the one that was really big about um, really curbing the power of those said large industries. OK, and so he did the Underwood tariff that helped balance tariffs that were being used um, uh, for foreign goods coming in. He did the Federal Reserve Act, which is still something that we use today to kind of help determine the money flow of America. He did the, the Sherman Clayton antitrust which basically also, um, as you can see here in the political cartoon, forced companies to have to reveal their books and reveal who these corporations were under, which shell companies they were under. And so it revealed kind of more of the underbelly of the corporations so they can no longer be protected behind the corporate law that was giving them a tremendous amount of rights during that time. And then we have the 18th and 19th Amendments also being passed under Good old Woodrow Wilson that, of course, for the, the ladies in the house, holla, we have liberty, finally, that we have been looking for. We'll catch you on the next time.